So for day three, which was actually going to be our first day of investigation, I awoke in time to watch the sun come up against the inside of the courtyard as well. And for the third day in a row, I heard children singing. I would love to spend a lot of time there to investigate this specific phenomenon because it's the most beautiful singing and it's just faint enough where you can't make out words. You can just hear melody. But I heard it and it lasts for about 15, 20 minutes until it slowly fades away and then nothing is there. Before we got started, I took a walk outside the grounds of Chillingham Castle and uh, I don't know if I would call it praying per se because I wasn't like asking you know God to do anything because we were just making a movie but I, I did kind of you know speak to the universal song you know uh, the energy of the world and just said please let us finish this process without anyone being physically or emotionally hurt because I did believe in what we were doing. I do believe in the power of the mind, but there's nothing to prove that it ultimately exists. There's a lot of, you know, studies from MK Ultra and things like that, but there's nothing you could point at and say, look at this example. This is guaranteed proof. And we're never going to get there unless we start trying. So Mary Beth saw me walking around and she came down the driveway and said, Hey, so I've been thinking. And I said, about what? And she was like, I want to change my, you know, my role in this. So Mary Beth saw me at the end of the driveway and she walked down and said, Hey, I've been thinking about this and I want to change my role in this process. Now remember She's the only one who knows even a little bit of what I'm planning because I realized before it ever started that I have to have somebody working on the inside with me to steer things in a certain direction should everything just go shithouse wrong. But she did not know everything that I had planned, not even close. And as things were initially set up, what she knew is that she was going to be the control. She was going to conduct the investigation by which all other investigations would be compared to. That means that she would not do sleep deprivation. She would not do chemical alteration. And she would not do sensory aggravation. She would just simply ghost hunt the castle. And I'm like, okay, let me get in my head. Well, why would... Why would she not want that role? That's easy. I mean, all you gotta do is just go ghost hunt the dopest place we've ever been to. Why does she want to change it? And Mary Beth is an extremely smart girl. Uh, by the way, guys, my stomach's kind of rumbling right now, so you might hear that every now and then. That's nothing paranormal, I promise you. Uh, but Mary Beth is an extremely smart girl, and she is already, you know, on her own trying to figure out you know, where my, my end game is. And I said, okay, well, what is it that you want to change? And she goes, well, I think I need to do the sleep deprivation. I'm like, okay, well, why do you want to do it? And she's like, well, you fall asleep you know, all the time anyway. So you already have to fight to keep yourself awake. You know, she's like, and you have to be the one running all of this. So if you're going to do the sleep deprivation on top of your natural narcolepsy, you know, I don't want this documentary to wind up being the AGH team goes on vacation. That would be the biggest nightmare if that were the case. So after thinking about it, I said, you know, that makes a lot of sense because I get the feeling that once we start going, this castle is going to give us 
all we want and more. Uh, you know, the one thing that I've always believed is that a person's degree of belief will determine the actual evidence they experience. With that being the case, when it comes to Chillingham Castle, I have zero, zero degree of disbelief. I am certain that it is haunted. There's no way that kind of terror could exist within those walls for thousands of years without, you know, having an immense amount of activity you know, being available to access at any time. All you have to do is believe in it. And if you do, then kind of the basis of the whole documentary is that. If you have no veil of disbelief, then you're going to experience everything, you know, Chillingham Castle has to offer. So I said, okay, is there anything else? And she said, well, in addition to, you know, me doing the sleep deprivation, I think you need to do your investigation, which is the control now. You need to do that tonight and get it out of the way. That's the control, so let's get it out of the way right away. I'm like, okay. And she goes, then when you're doing your investigation, I can kind of control things in whichever direction I want them to go for you, you know, because I will be in the control room with the team. I said, you're correct. I need you to watch over things while I'm in there. Make sure Joey doesn't take off and do anything weird. Uh, make sure Justin doesn't do anything to freak, you know, Joey out. Um, and let's see, you know, what happens during my actual ghost hunt. But there was one more thing that she wanted me to do. She wanted me to tell everybody that night what I had planned for each of them. And I had thought about that a lot, which I decided, yes, let's do that. Because the one thing I do want to show is the natural buildup of anxiety. Because that clearly had taken an effect on Mary Beth and I. It had taken an effect on everybody. I mean, Joe was not having fun. Justin was not really talking to anybody. Um, you know, we, we certainly were not on vacation. I told everyone to take the day to kind of enjoy themselves because that night before I began my investigation, I was going to let everybody know what they would be doing during their investigation. At that point, I could see that everybody had their own kind of a level of anxiety. You know, Mary Beth knew bits and pieces of, you know, the process. So, uh, she seemed... You know, more kind of quiet and focused. Justin just seemed in, you know, protector mode, which I, I knew he would go into that mode. Whenever Justin is unsure of something, he just has this kind of marine switch. He becomes a fighter, you know, and I knew he would go there. And Joey looked scared. Yeah, he looked even more scared now, you know. So we broke for the day, and I think everybody just tried to calm themselves down before finally meeting back in the main HQ for the entire event, which was uh, the, the cafeteria with the giant horns that I was telling you guys about, the giant moose horns. Um, so what was crazy is we get in there and we're getting ready to have our, our meeting to go over everything. And as we're talking about it, I notice just over Justin's shoulder... Kieran is sitting right next to the main monitor. And in the dungeon, I see this like cloud of swirling mist that just comes firing around the hallway. And it is moving really fast, but stopping like on a dime. And what's really weird is in the dungeon, there's no like open air pathway that would allow that kind of movement of uh, wind or any kind of breeze or anything like that in which I'm super stoked, but I got to be honest right away. I'm thinking, is this me? Is this my psychokinetic 
uh, ability in play right now because now that we've switched and I'm not going to be doing sleep deprivation, which only I know at that time, are we already starting to experience activity? Because with you know me going in as the normal investigator, my honest goal is to capture evidence. That's all I want to do. I want to go in. I want to ghost hunt Chillingham Castle. My prayers are that we will have the most intense ghost hunt we've ever had and that we will turn up some of the most intense investigation we've ever filmed. And before I can even talk to my team, before I even get the chance to speak with them, events appear to already be happening. So we have this discussion back and forth about, you know, whether or not this is something that's, you know, real or not. Is it something we should be concerned with? And and everybody kind of comes to the same determination that, yeah, this is strange. This should not be happening. And as soon as possible, I need to get myself down in that dungeon and see if John Sage is mulling about and waiting for me. But remember, before we can do that, everybody else is waiting for more information about their forthcoming investigation. In which I tell Justin, I know that you, to this point, have heard that you're going to do sensory aggravation. If you want to know specifically what that means, without giving you details as to how I'm going to do it, I'm going to make you extremely uncomfortable focusing on vision and sound. And that's all I tell him. It's not going to be enjoyable. He is not going to like it. It should have a dramatic effect on his ability to conduct a standard paranormal investigation. In which Joe is just going, oh man, fuck this. He's just hearing Justin's thing, which is not even his investigation. He's already, he's already determined that's too crazy to do. Like, that's ridiculous. This is stupid. And he's doing this. He's doing this in the back of the room where we edited so much of this out. And it was driving me nuts because he's just pacing at the back of the room and just swearing like crazy. So I would say, you know, so we're going to do this, Justin. You hear, fuck, the back of the room and... You just hear, this is fucking stupid. You know, you just hear this over and over again to the point where Kieran is also, you know, looking at Joe and wondering, is this guy in any position right now to be attempting any sort of paranormal investigation under this level of anxiety that he's, you know, experiencing? You know, another thing we noticed with Joe is every time he would come to a meeting, he would be covered in sweat. And we were like, why is Joe always covered in sweat? So I finally asked him, I said, dude, why are you always drenched, dude? He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, Joe, look at your, your head. And I pull off his hat and he's just got sweat beads all over his head. Well, what was going on is whether Joe would go to, uh, you know, the bathroom, whether he would go to the cafeteria, whether he would go outside from where his bed was, he had a long walk. And they were all through the basement corridor to get out. And he could not bring himself to just walk. He would sprint every single time as fast as he possibly could from point A to point B. And because it was hot there, he would just start sweating like crazy. And this was every single time. So, I mean, he was really, really amped up. You know, so I said to him, well, Joe, look, as you know, we've discussed that you are going to take part in an investigation in which you will be chemically altered, in which Joe right away just starts laying into me how unfair this is. And I knew his personality and I knew that he would, of course, want to go to England and he would want to, you know, see all this stuff, but never under these circumstances. So he kept saying to me, you can't keep saying it was your choice to come. It was your choice to come because you knew, man, you knew that I would choose to come because you know, I don't know how to say no to cool stuff like this. But you also know that I don't want to do this, man. You know, he was like, you're just playing me against me. And I said, Joe, listen, man, and part of that is very true. 
But I was upfront about that. You know, I told you in the beginning, it doesn't have to be you. I would like it to be you. I would like you to be the one to take on this role of chemical alteration to see what happens, you know, to a person's mind when they are chemically altered in King Edward Longshank's haunted room. You know, I, I, I want to see what happens. And I, I did. I told him from the beginning, it does not have to be you. You can say no. Did I think that he would turn it down? No. Now that we're there, what's going on with him is he can see how much time, effort, energy, money, like how much has gone into making this happen. And now he feels trapped. Now he feels like he couldn't walk out if he wanted to. That he would be hurting too many people, you know, that he loves, that he cares about, that he would be hurting the project. Uh, he's got himself in a, a very real psychological, you know, situation here. He wants to just go home. But he also does want to battle this and win. He's just pissed. He's pissed. So he says to me, so is that what's going to happen, dude? You're just going to, you know, what, man? Just like sneak some drugs into my food? Uh, you know, I'm not going to know when this is going to happen. And I said, Chow, come on, man. I'm not going to do that to you. I'm not going to poison you. There ain't nobody putting drugs in your system but you. I can promise you that. And I meant it. That was a real promise. If this was going to work, Joe Ansley would have to take the medication given to him. And he would have to administer those chemicals himself into his own body. That's the only way this was going to happen because I was not comfortable being somebody that put illegal drugs into his system. It's something he would have to choose to do. So he's freaking out. I mean, he's just freaking out. And he won't stop. He just keeps swearing and walking back and forth and walking back and forth. And uh, I don't know what to, you know, ultimately uh, think about his position right now. Except for I have faith that this will work out. And I believe in the end, in the end, Joe will see the value in this experiment. That's what I'm praying for. I'm praying that he will see the value. So basically I tell him, you got to stop this though. You got to stop walking around swearing. You got to stop, you know, calling me a motherfucker. Uh, you know, you got to stop saying fuck off. Uh, you, you have to stop all of it. You know, either you're on board or you are not. And if you're not, let's get you on a plane and get you out of here. And the second I tell him that, then he's, you know, freaking, you know, <laughs> he's freaking out even more. He's like, dude, is that what you want to do? You just want to, you know, get rid of me? And I'm like, no, what I need you to do is calm yourself down and be an adult right now and be a part of this process. Find a family in us and be a part of this process. Which for the rest of that night, he did. He did. And part of that was because he wasn't going that night. He wasn't going on his investigation. But I was. It was time for me to go. And at that time, this crazy fog was still moving around. Uh, you know, John Sage's dungeon, which was terrifying. I mean, it was, you know, and this is in the documentary as well, too. We only used a few seconds of it. But this went on for a good, like, half hour. And what's crazy is for four hours before, uh, you know, this foggy looking stuff was moving around the room nothing had moved the room was completely just visually silent there was nothing 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 moved nothing shifted you couldn't see anything it was completely fine and then right when we're ready to go 
right when I'm fired up to go capture what you know whatever it is that I can find there it was almost like this thing stuck out of hand to wave hello through the monitor and say come on big fella let's get this shit done and I was stoked I was so stoked I mean this was a childhood dream come true the opportunity to solo investigate Chillingham Castle to solo investigate John Sage's dungeon. It does not get any more intense than that. So at this point, my team gets together. They find their spot for watching the investigation. Uh, keep in mind, I have no way to contact them. They have no way to contact me. They can see me. I can't see them. I am completely cut off from them, period. So should they see some sort of black figure appear behind me, uh, they will have no way to communicate that to me. Um, should I need their help, uh, for some reason, they're going to have to determine that through visual cues and just by watching the situation. Yes, this is a more dangerous way of investigating than we would typically ever do. But that was part of the program, it was part of the concept. The idea was to take the fear factor through the roof. To genuinely create fight or flight. That was the goal. So I stop off and tell Kieran I'm on my way. And there I go. By the time I got to the courtyard, my heart was definitely pounding. I mean, I could hear it physically. I was freaked out. I got over to the main door, which I had been in and out of probably three times since I had been there. And it wouldn't open for some reason. It wasn't dead bolted or anything. It just had uh, kind of like a spindle wooden plank door. So... I mean, I wrestled with that thing for probably, I don't know, five minutes, five, ten minutes to get it to open. And I finally had to just put a massive shoulder into it just to blow it open. I got inside and right away, that all too familiar feeling that you get as a ghost hunter when you uh, know something is there. And I'll be the first to admit that this could have 100% been like placebo, like, you know, uh, the story is just so built up in your mind, you know. And just a disturbing history of, of John, you know, and the, the murders that have been, you know, conducted in this area of the prison. It's just, it's horrible, especially their child murders, which is the worst, the worst. And you got to remember, too, it's not like in America where we only have like 200 years of American history. You know, and we don't know how far back, you know, history goes from there. We don't know the length of, you know, American Indian history. We don't know that. Before that, we don't know. Like, we don't know, but we do know there have been thousands of years of history in England, thousands of years in Scotland. There's just been so much history, and not just history, bloody, violent, brutal history. So right away, I'm just like, John, if you're here, let's do this. Let's get this on. There is no reason whatsoever to, to fart around and be nice. I don't like you. I don't like your history. I think you are a foul human being. You know, I hope that in the afterlife you are suffering on a new level for what you've done to you know, parents and children. And right away, right away, I'm just you know provoking as hard as I can. And right away you start hearing knocks here. I mean, 
if I had, you know, a nickel for every knock that I heard inside that castle. And again, I want to be the first one to say that, uh, you know, this is a stone castle, you know, built by hand. And they are not built to, you know, scale proficiency. So there has to be a degree of settling that is just unbelievable. That just, uh, you know, a ridiculous amount. There has to be. So what I'm trying to do more than anything is to, deter is to determine what is the sound of settling versus something that's not, you know. If within an hour I can get the same sound to appear in the same corner, you know, of the room over and over again, then we can start to determine if that is a settling sound from that area, if you walk into that area. You know, so I'm, I'm really working as fast as I can to try to pick up those types of sounds. You just never know, you know. That's why I say I'm never, uh, I, I'm not a psychic, right? I don't have psychic ability. But I think we all have intuition. And I'm a big believer in following that intuition. If, if you feel as though someone is in the room with you in a certain position... You know, I would say follow that gut feeling. More often than not, I have found results under that basic functionality. You know, if, if you feel like something is happening somewhere because uh, you think, a, you know, a person is there, you know, just follow that gut feeling. Just follow it. Worst case scenario, you'll be wrong. That's all. Just be wrong. So anyways, right as I decide to leave the dungeon, I turn and look at the open door all the way down to the south end of the dungeon, the complete other side of the room. And there's some kind of uh, dimly lit light that is kind of lighting the doorway and the hallway. Okay, well enough where I could see, uh, you know, that that's a, an exit. So right as I turn to walk towards that, I definitely get, God, the best way to describe it would be like a, oh man, like an energy um, buzz. I mean, it was just like a, it felt like when you get static electricity and you could feel it like rise your hair up. Like as I turned towards the door, I just felt this whoom and you know, all the hair on my arm stood up, uh, on my goatee stood up, like all of it. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Totally stepped back, knew for a fact that something was right there. Which I just said to him, John, listen, if you're here with me, then you got to come with me right now. Because I've been down here for too long, and I'm not going to spend the whole night in your damn dungeon. You know? If you're such a badass, follow me. And I start making my way throughout the castle. And the whole time I'm walking, I'm feeling like someone is definitely behind me. Definitely. And, and this feeling is in every room that I go to. I mean, it literally feels like someone's walking with me. That's the best way I can describe it. It feels like someone is walking with me. So I finally get into this room that has this beautiful, like, hawk. These beautiful, like, hanging curtains. And these long seats with these long pads on it. And at this point, you know, I've been at it for several, several hours. And my, my feet are starting to hurt. My back is starting to hurt. It's the old, you know... The pains of ghost hunting are starting to settle in. <laughs> and I know that this is just about over. So I figure, well, I'm going to go after John Sage as much as I can. In which I start just laying into him, just provoking him with everything I have. So once I take a seat right away, I start calling if he's there. Are you here, John? Are you here? 
and I start explaining that into today's world, he wouldn't last five minutes. That when you hurt children or women, you are the scum of the prison. That you're not revered in any capacity. And I start explaining to him how much of a coward he is for hurting any child. And I tell him that he would be absolutely annihilated by the other prison inmates. In which right away I hear this, mmm, like very, very, very deep and disturbing, just groan. I'm like, whoa. It was terrifying. I mean, that, the, the base of it, like I felt it. It's like I felt it in my chest. It just, mm. I'm like, oh my God. So I decided to stand up. And I say it again. And I'm like, you're such a coward. In today's world, your kind would never be allowed to survive a prison situation. And I hear it again. Mm. I jump right back in like, that's right. I mean it. You'd be somebody's bitch. And right as I say that, I just hear shh, this slide. And then something big and heavy just hits and wraps around my legs in which I freak out. Absolutely freak out from the impact. I jump backwards. I'm like, what is going on? I jump back over and look, and the entire cushion, the entire cushion of this pew is on the floor, and it's heavy. It's like, this isn't like a really soft, uh, you know, cushion. This is a very thick, cushioned, uh, cushion from a pew. It's super heavy. It's super heavy. But I get running out, I'm freaking out, and I'm yelling, uh, downstairs, right around the corner of the hallway from me, I'm yelling downstairs to the team. I'm like, did you see that? Did you see that? It happened so fast, they just they didn't see it. And I'm like, you did not see that? And they're like, no. And I'm just like, you don't understand what just happened. And they didn't. So at first, you could see that their response is just kind of like, what is he freaking out about? Yeah, and it's slowly coming to light as they are seeing the impossibility of what we just captured on film. Slowly but surely, they're putting it together. Oh my God. Something massive, something heavy gave Chad an incredible intelligent response. Did exactly what he asked for. And we need to get back and find the footage and find a way to determine if this was a psychokinetic event or if this was just a garden variety paranormal event. Having experienced it, I knew it was special. I knew it was something very, very, very special. But we had to go through the process. We had to go through the process of, you know, breaking it down and figuring out exactly what had happened. Before we could actively say it was anything that we can tie into our investigation. But I knew it was. I knew it was from being the person in the room. I knew it was. I knew it was something incredibly special. And I could see on Kieran's face that it was quickly becoming, quickly becoming incredible to him too. Because Kieran is just like I am. He is a skeptical believer. 99.99% .99 of the time he doesn't believe. And it takes a lot to get him to believe. And I'm the same way. It takes so much to get me to say, okay, that was probably something paranormal. 
or even further, that was something paranormal. To get me to say, that was something paranormal. And I just knew what had taken place up there. I knew what had taken place. But rather than try to get everybody to attack it right there at, you know, four in the morning. I figured, let's let everybody go back to sleep. Everything was monitored. We had nothing but cameras throughout this place. I want everyone getting a good night's rest. You know, I want rested minds. Uh, everybody except Mary Beth, of course. I want sharp intellect, and I want to determine what happened. And what I had just realized was the chapel. <laughs> I had no idea initially that I was even in the chapel. Why? Because I fell asleep during the history walk, remember? Which, as you all will see, the fact that I fell asleep during that initial history walk will actually play a key factor as to how and why this event actually took place. So as we're walking back to our rooms that night, I look at Mary Beth and I say, are you okay? Are you going to be able to stay up that late until tomorrow night to do this? And she says, yes. And it's Joey says, well, don't worry, bro. I'll make sure she has company. I'm going to stay up with her. And I said, Joe, I can't have you doing that, man. I need you to go to bed. She took this on. You know, it's all good. I'm sure she appreciates the effort, but I really, really need you to get some rest. And then she kind of slugs it off and says, okay. I was surprised. I was like, wow, that was somewhat easy. Which Mary Beth looks at me and says, I'll be okay. Which I say, okay. So I got back to my room. And right as I shut the door, I hear a knock on it. And I open it up and it's Kieran. And he says, let's talk in the morning. And I say, okay. And he goes, I'm really concerned with Joe. He goes, I'm really, really concerned. I go, okay. He goes, I understand that you want this, you know, this experiment to be real. And you want the results to be real, and I totally get it, and I'm all for it. And, you know, you do have my support. But we need to discuss what could potentially happen. Because I don't think you've totally thought this through. Which I shook his hand and said, Kieran, let's talk in the morning.